let's talk about the math class. The math class is a class, and most classes have data values and methods. The math class has both of these, and we're going to start talking about its methods or its doers. And we're going to save the data values for later, which are its spheres or things that represent a value inside of the class. The first method that we're going to look at is the square root method. And when we're talking about methods, the first thing that we want to say is what is its function? What is its purpose? And the purpose of square root is to return the square root of a value. And in this slide, I've shown you two examples of this. 16 and 8.5 would return 4.0 and 2.91, so on and so forth. Now, I want to look at the square root method more in depth because you can just look at a method and say, well, what is its function? But there's other important things to know about it. These things are, what data type are you giving it? What data type is being returned to the program? What sequence is the data going in? And how many pieces of data are you giving to it? And so let's do that with square root. So the name is square root. The data type in is a double. And if you look at this example right here, you might say, well, you're crazy. That's an integer. That's not a double value. Well, that 16 is going to be converted into a double when it goes into the method. And that conversion is not shown anywhere because you're taking an integer, which is a smaller value, putting it into a larger data type like a double. And the computer does not need to tell you when that happens. The next thing is what happens when it's returned? Well, you'll notice that even though the square root of 16 is an even value of 4, it does not return an integer, it returns a double. Because most of the time, the result of a square root is going to be a double. So no matter what you put into it, it's always going to return a double. It's going to take in a double, return a double. The sequence isn't going to matter here because there's only one value being passed, and the quantity is only one. You only pass one argument to it. The next method I want to talk about is abs, and it's short for absolute value. And what it does is it returns the absolute value of a value. So I have negative 16 and 8.5 as my arguments, and it's going to return 16 and 8.5. If we break it down as we did with the square root, we would get the method name being abs, the data type in. Well, what is the data type in here? It's an integer, and what is it returning? Notice it's not returning a double, it's returning an integer. The sequence is not applicable here because you only have one value going in, and the quantity is one because there's only one argument being passed. Now you may be wondering, why do I have this extra line down here? It's because these are actually two separate methods with the exact same name. If we did method name, it would be abs, but look what's being passed. It's a double value instead of an integer. And look what's being returned, a double value instead of an integer. The sequence is going to be the same. There's only one value being passed in, so there is no sequence. And quantity is still one. When you have a method that has the exact same name, but it is implemented differently, this one takes in integers and returns integers, this one takes in doubles and returns to doubles, it's called overloading, or the method is overloaded. And the abs method is one of those methods that is overloaded. In the next method, we're going to look at pow, and it stands for power. And what it's going to do, it's going to raise the first value to the power of the second value. So in this case, it would be 5 to the power of 6 or 6 to the power of 5. And so we get these outputs. The name is pal. The data type is double double. Notice it looks like it's taking in integers, but when it actually gets into the method itself, it's going to convert whatever you put here into doubles. It's also going to return a double. It will never return an integer. The sequence is base and then exponent. And the sequence is important here because if you do 5, 6 and then 6, 5, you're going to get completely different results. So you need to know what is the correct sequence to put the arguments in because the base comes before the exponent, not the exponent before the base. And then lastly, the quantity is 2 in this case. There are two arguments that need to be passed to math.pal. The next method that we're going to look at is max, and the method max returns the maximum values of two values. There are two given values here, 5 and 6, and it's going to return the maximum of them, which in this case is 6, and the maximum of these two values is 6.8. So the name is max, data type in is an integer and an integer, 
the return type is an integer, the sequence is a number number, and the sequence isn't important here. In math.pal, the sequence is important because it's base followed by exponent. But if you put the 6 first and the 5 next, or the 5 first and the 6 next, it really doesn't matter in terms of sequence. And the quantity is going to be 2. And this is important, and let me show you why. Look what I've tried to do here. I've tried to add a third value. And if I try to do that, it's going to cause an error. You cannot increase the quantity of a method just because you want to add one more value and say, oh, I want the maximum of three values instead of two values. It just doesn't work. Methods only work the way the designer wrote them. Now, I have a second line here, just like I did with absolute value, and it's going to be for the same reason. The method name is max. The data type in is a double here. We have double, double, and then we return a double. And so you can see that this is a different implementation of a method with the exact same name, max and max. The sequence is going to be the same, a number and a number, or an argument and an argument. And the quantity is the same, two and two. We call this overloading, or the method is overloaded, because we have a method with the exact same name, but the implementation is different. Let's look at max's counterpart, which is min. And it returns the minimum value of two values. So if I have 5 and 6, it would return 5 or 5.4 in the second line there. So we see it returns the minimum values. The name of the method is min. The data type in for the first method is integer integer. The return type is int. You'll notice there's no decimal here. The sequence is two numbers, and the order does not matter. And the quantity is 2. Just like max, min does not allow you to add more than two in terms of quantity. Methods can only be used the way the designer wrote them. And the second line is just going to indicate that this second one right here is an overloaded method. Instead of taking in two integers, as this case, it's taking in two double values. It's going to return a double value, so we see the decimal place here. The sequence is the same as above, and the quantity is the same as above. These are two separate methods. And they're overloaded because they have the same name, but they're implemented differently. Next, we're going to look at some rounding methods. This one is floor, and it returns a value that is less than or equal to the argument and is equal to an integer. So the argument is this value right here. And we can just sum this up by saying it's going to round down. No matter what value this is right here, if there is a value after it, it is going to round down, and so we get 10.0. So the name of the method is floor. The data type in is a double. The data returned, and this is important, is a double. And let me show you why it's important that it returns a double. Commonly, when you think of rounding, you think of a decimal place being removed. In essence, the decimal place is being removed by having the zero there, but we see this causes a problem because what is this returning right now? It's returning a double, and I'm trying to store it as an int, and that will definitely give me an error because I'm moving from a larger data type into a smaller data type, and so therefore I'm going to need a typecast. And so when I add that typecast, it's going to work fine, and num1 would store 10. The sequence, there is no sequence because there's only one value being passed. And the quantity is one. There's only one argument that needs to pass to the floor method. Its counterpart is seal. And seal is short for ceiling. And it returns a value that is greater than or equal to the argument and is equal to an integer. To sum that up, it really just means that it's going to round up. So if there is a value past the decimal place, it is going to round up, and it returns 11.0. The method name is seal. The data type in is a double. Important again, it returns a double. Just like it was wrong to do this statement with floor, it's wrong to do this statement with seal, because this is returning a double value. We'd have to typecast it, and now we'd get the correct value, which would be 11. The sequence, there is no sequence, because it's only one value and the quantity is one. You only have to pass one argument to the method. The third rounding method is called round, and it uses something called ties rounding, or returns the closest long to the argument with ties rounding up. And what ties rounding up is the rounding that you experienced, hopefully, in math class. 0.5 and above would round up. 0.4 and below would round down. 
and we see it does exactly that. Notice it does not return a double value. The name of the method is round. The data type in is a double, but it returns a long, and that's going to be important because if we do a statement like this, int num1 math.round 10.5, it's going to cause an error. And you say, well, why? Because long is a larger data type than an integer. If we're going to put 10.5 into a smaller value, like an int, we would have to typecast it. That's why it's important to know what data type is being returned. There is no sequence because there's only one value being passed and the quantity is one. Next, we have a very important method, random, and it does what it sounds like. It finds a random number, but by itself, it's not very impressive. It finds a random number between 0.0, .0 and 1. 0 is included, 1 is not. So if we look at line 1 here, notice I've added line numbers here. Please, if you're going to type this code, do not add these numbers as they will cause errors. I have them here just to refer to the line that I'm speaking of. And we see the range is expressed instead of like this as bracket 0.0, .0 comma 1.0 parentheses. And that parentheses means that this 1.0 is non-inclusive. The bracket means that this 0.0, .0 is inclusive. So zero could be included, one could not. The name of the method is random. Data type in is nothing. Random is a method that does not take anything into its parameters. It does, however, return a double. There is no sequence because it doesn't take in anything. And there is no quantity because there is no value being passed. Let's see what this range would look like if we ran this right here. It would give us an output, but the output isn't very impressive. And this is just a possible output. It's a number between 0 and 1. And there aren't many times when you need that, so we need to do something to tweak it. That's why I've added the rest of the lines here. So we take the value, and instead of just having it by itself on line 2, we're going to multiply it times 10. And watch what that does to the range. It's 0, 0.0 to 10, with 10 being exclusive or not included. So the maximum value would be 9.9 .9 repeating. What that would look like is this value over here, 6.57, so on and so forth. Now, again, this is a possible output because we're dealing with a range. And this is getting closer to our goal, but it's not quite there. You usually don't use decimal values when you're using random numbers. So let's take one more step to the random method in order to make it more useful. And so what I've done on this next line is I have typecast it as an int. So it's going to lop off whatever that decimal place is. And notice that I've put parentheses around math.random times 10. If you don't do that, you're always going to get 0. And so now our range is 0 to 9. Notice I've changed this instead of a parentheses to a bracket, so both 0 and 9 are inclusive. I no longer have 0.0, .0 because it's going to give me an integer value, and a possible value would be 6. So this is actually a very useful range, 0 to 9. Let's say that I didn't want to start at 0. I wanted to start at 5. Well, I've made one more change here, and if you want to have a minimum that's not 0, all you do is add it at the end here. So I say plus 5. Instead of the minimum being 0, the minimum is going to be 5. And this might be a little bit confusing, but the upper bound or the top value is 14, not 10. This does not represent the highest value in the range. What it represents is the number of values inside of the range. So the number of possible values inside of this range is 10. Now, what I want to show you is how did I get from this method call right here to this range? Well, what I did is I added the two numbers together and then I subtracted 1. 10 plus 5 is 15 minus 1 is 14. And you'll notice that that is my upper bound or my maximum value, 14. The biggest mistake beginning programmers make is looking at these two values and thinking that it's the minimum and the maximum. This is the minimum right here, but this is not the maximum. You have to use a small amount of math to find the maximum. 
let's say that I gave you a range and I wanted you to figure out what is going to go in this method call right here. And in doing this, I can check to make sure that I did my math correctly. So what you do is you take the upper bound minus the lower bound and then add one or the maximum minus the minimum and add one. So that would look like this. 14 minus 5, take the maximum minus the minimum, is 9, plus 1 is 10. And so you notice right here, 10 is the value that goes inside of this method call. And so now you know how to look at a method and determine what the range is and start with the range and convert it into a method call. Now we spent a lot of time on methods, and that's not the only part of the math class. There's also the data values, and that's what pi and e are. And the important thing to know about data values is what is their purpose and what is their name. Notice that pi is capital P, capital I, and e is just capital E. You could not use lowercase e or lowercase p, lowercase i. The purpose of pi is that it is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, or it's the mathematical representation of pi, and e is Euler's number, which is the base of the natural logarithms. These numbers would look something like this, 3.14159, so on and so forth, 2.71828. How can you recognize that you're dealing with attributes versus methods? A method will always have parentheses. Notice these have no parentheses at the end, so therefore you must conclude that they are some kind of value inside of the class. They are a beer in the class, not a doer. So now we have a pretty good idea of what the math class is and what's inside of it. So let's go ahead and sum it up. The math class is a collection of math-related methods and data values. Notice everything that we've covered deals with math in some kind of way. It has both methods, which do something, and data values, which are something. What's important to know about methods? Probably most important, what do they do? What is their purpose? What is their function? Next, their name. Make sure you spell it right. A common mistake is to put ceiling instead of seal. Know the data type that's going into the method. Know the data type that's being returned once the method is done. Know its sequence, kind of like with the method pow, its sequence is important. 4 comma 5 is very different from 5 comma 4. And know the quantity. As in the case of max or min, both of those can only take in two values. You can't just decide, hey, today I want them to take in three values and find the maximum and the minimum values. Methods can be overloaded, and I've shown you a few of those abs, max, and min all are overloaded, meaning that they have a method with the exact same name, but it has a different implementation. Like abs can take in an integer value, and that's one method, and abs can take in a double value, and that's another method. So anytime you have a method with the same name, but it's implemented differently, it's called overloaded. And lastly, what's important about data values? Their function and their name. Pi is the mathematical equivalent of pi, and e is Euler's number. So it's important to know their function or their purpose or why are they there? What do they represent inside of the class? And then finally, their name. As I mentioned earlier, make sure that you capitalize the p and the i, otherwise it won't work, or you capitalize the e. That's the way that it is spelled and used inside of the class. The math class is a very useful class inside of Java. And analyzing it or any class in this way will help prevent many, many errors in the future and lead to better coding.